It's no secret that systemic change in policing in America is long overdue. The fight to end police misconduct is now a centuries-long struggle, and our nation needs 21st century ideas to turn the tide. And to fix our system, we've got to know what's broken. Well, on Friday, the Justice Department released a scathing report into the Minneapolis Police Department. The Justice Department launched the sprawling investigation following the death of George Floyd three years ago. Now, this report exposed the underbelly of a police department that disproportionately targeted black and Native American people and routinely used excessive force. I know you're wondering, what did all of this actually look like in practice? Well, the report found black drivers were six times more likely to be stopped by police than white drivers. And in one instance, a black teen accused of stealing a $5 burrito was held at gunpoint by police. We also learned over a more than six-year period, officers used neck restraints on citizens nearly 200 times. And police did not make an arrest in 44 of those encounters. Those neck restraints are similar to what led to the murder of George Floyd. While this new report is, in fact, devastating, it's just a glimpse into what policing in America really looks like. In a new column that is out today, the Washington Post editorial board argues, quote, these pattern and practice reviews fell out of favor during Donald Trump's presidency, but their return is welcome. The oversight of the Justice Department plus the push of a consent decree might be what's necessary to reverse longstanding and deplorable trends in Minneapolis and elsewhere. Joining me now is Minnesota's Attorney General, Keith Ellison. A.G. Ellison, thank you so much for uh, being here. I, I know you spoke Thanks at the so press much. conference. Very, very good to see you, sir. Uh, how do you hope that the weight of the Justice Department can spark change in Minneapolis? Well, you know, Simone, after we successfully prosecuted, you know, Derek Chauvin and the other officers who killed George Floyd, my big fear was that people would dismiss that and say, well, you know what? We got rid of the bad actors. Now we'll just go back to business as usual. This report, report plus the state report, there's two now. We're talking about the DOJ one, but there was a state one as well. They show that we have a systematic, serious problem that is not just a one bad apple problem. It is a systemic problem. But I got to tell you, I really feel that we have uh, better days ahead if we take these recommendations seriously and we implement them in good faith, we can we can be a model for police community relations if we commit ourselves. As you accurately said in your intro, this is a hundred year old problem. It's not just Minneapolis, it's all over the country. We we all saw the Tyree Nichols tragedy. We all know about all the other cases that we can name all day and all night. Uh, but let's say this is the moment that we finally take the turn, take the change that we need, uh, because this report shows, uh, you, and you can't deny that this is comprehensive, longstanding. I mean, the, I encourage people to read um, the report. The Justice Department really did uh, uh, deep dive work on this. And I want to highlight uh, two of the women who helped lead the charge in this particular investigation, Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark and Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta. Here is what they had to say about moving really? forward. These findings are serious, and we enter the path to reform with a plan to put in place lasting and enduring changes that will ensure the constitutional, fair, and non-discriminatory policing to which people in this great city are entitled. To the people of Minneapolis, police reform does not happen overnight, and it does not happen without you. It will take time, focused effort, and sustained commitment. In the months ahead, we will need this entire community to help us craft solutions that will result in real and lasting change here in Minneapolis. A.G. Ellison, what are you hearing from the community uh, about this report? And are there any plans to form an advisory committee uh, or something of the sort? Well, let me tell you, people have heard it before. It's not new. I tell you this, in the, in the year of 1997, a jury after hearing an entire police brutality case, found that there was a pattern and practice of uh, discriminatory and excessive force in policing. This is the mid-1990s, so we've seen it before. So be with that, there's, just, there's a notable skepticism. But what I say to folks is, you know, cynicism is easy. We can always say everything sucks, nothing's going to get better. But I do think that for those people who really want a better day, 
this might be a watershed moment. Remember, the city of Newark, New Jersey, was under federal decree, and they got in there and they turned it around. Now Mayor Roz Baraka is saying, you know, I think that we are uh, we don't need the oversight anymore. So I think that um, you know we are in a position where we can we can really start and move forward in a brand new way. And and I just want to also say, people who think that somehow doing this report will you know, cause morale issues in police, and mm. then that might spark greater crime. I think those folks, you know, are are not right. I think that dealing with this problem is the way to go forward for public safety and civil and human rights. So I, that's I think what this I think is about a it. this is an important point that you're making, um, uh, General Ellison, because bad, good good police officers don't like bad police officers. G good right. police officers do not want officers to engage in misconduct um, because it does reflect poorly on the entirety of the force, and it affects everyone's ability to work with the community. Uh, I mean, you used to be a member of Congress. That's how I know you yeah. uh, originally. And I think that while the pattern and practice investigations that the Biden-Harris administration have started back up, there were none during the Trump administration, I think there's also right. a role for Congress to play. So. How, yeah. I mean, how should Congress act to reform our system? Well, let's start with passing the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. You know very well that uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass carried that through the House. She did a wonderful job. And you know that Cory Booker did a great job in the Senate. Unfortunately, when we needed Tim Scott to st step up and get this thing through his caucus, he reneged on that. And so th the bill continues to languish. But the problems doesn't go, don't go away. We still have these uh, very difficult issues. Uh, there's there's a, been a lot of unfortunate, tragic clashes between citizens and police since George Floyd, um, and so the urgency remains. Uh, I will say that President Biden passed a executive order, which I thought is, has been helpful, but it doesn't deal with most of the policing in our country. Most of the policing in our country, 18,000 different police departments are spread across the nation and are under state and municipal jurisdiction, mm -hmm. not the federal. So we got it. So they've got to step up. But I, but I'll give President uh, Biden high marks. I think Congress needs to step up and do more. And I think this should be bipartisan. We do need our Republican uh, friends to work with us to make sure we improve the quality of justice for everybody. And now that they've been concerned about equal justice, maybe this is the time they're going to uh, join hands with Democrats and pass some, some meaningful legislation. Hmm. Well, we will be watching and waiting to see Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison. Thank you very much for kicking us off. Thank you, Simone.